this morning, I'd like to introduce myself. The last couple of times that I've spoken, I never really introduced myself properly. So for those who don't know me, uh, my name is John Owen, as it says on the screen. And surprisingly enough, I was named after the famous John Owen, the Puritan. Uh, my father is a reader of the Puritans uh, and being Owens, he named me John Owen. And it may well be that he named me in faith. I don't know. I've never actually asked him. Um, but in the providence of God, I became a Christian when I was 11 years old. The Lord saved me. Uh, I've worshipped much of my life at Milner Evangelical Church in the Northwest. Uh, I was actually converted at a Baptist church in Royton. Um, and the big question for me in coming to Christ was when I was asked, would you like to know Jesus Christ personally? Uh, I had all the Bible stories. My mother taught me the Bible from an early age. Um, but I was dead as a doornail, spiritually speaking. I used to lean on my mother's shoulder as a young child in church and fall asleep until uh, one day I was asked this golden question, really. Would you like to know Jesus Christ personally? And really, uh, through the person who asked me, that was God speaking. Uh, and that's when I prayed and asked the Lord to save me, and indeed he did. Now, some people come to Christ over a long period of time, uh, and other people come to Christ instantly. I instantly knew that God had saved me as a young child. And then, if you like, the battle and the struggles began. Uh, and it's the same today. We're in a spiritual battle. Uh, and we're going to be looking, really, at a spiritual battle this morning. And we're going to be looking at a book that you may not be very familiar with. Um, I don't claim to know all the answers to this book. Uh, God does, because it's his word. Uh, but we're going to look briefly at the book of Nahum. Uh, I'm going to read chapter one. So it's a fairly long reading. And if I go slightly over time, I apologize with what I have to say. But I hope that it's helpful to everyone. Uh, the main focus this morning is as William's prayer, really. It's to think about who God is and what he has done. That really is the focus. So uh, I'll read Nahum chapter 1, verses 1 to 15. The burden against Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkoshite. God is jealous and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. And the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry and dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither and the flower of Lebanon wilts. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt and the earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation and who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those who trust in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make an utter end of its place and darkness will pursue his enemies. What do you conspire against the Lord? He will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise up a second time, but while tangled like thorns and while drunken like drunkards, they shall be devoured like stubble fully dried. From you comes forth one who plots evil against the Lord a wicked counsellor. Thus says the Lord, though they are safe and likewise many, yet in this manner they will be cut down, 
when he passes through. Though I've afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. For now, I will break off his yoke from you and burst your bonds apart. The Lord has given the command concerning you. Your name shall be perpetuated no longer. Out of the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the molded image. I will dig your grave, for you are vile. Behold, on the mountains, the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. O oh, Judah, keep your appointed feasts, perform your vows, for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. Now, if you found that a difficult passage, you'll be one of many people, because uh, when you look at the book of Nahum, just if you've not looked at it before, just to uh, explain, many people have difficulty with its structure. It is poetry, scriptural poetry, uh, but otherwise the structure is very unusual. Like the book of Jonah 150 years earlier, it ends rather abruptly. Uh, Nahum ends with a question. Uh, and in terms of its structure, it's got a bit of everything. You're not sure who God is speaking to. One minute he seems to be speaking to the Ninevites, and the next minute he appears to be speaking to Judah. And the text itself, around verse 14, even contains quotes. Um, so there's lots of different elements in there which make it hard to understand, especially uh when God is speaking in the first person, I am speaking to you. Um, but to understand the one single principle, really, in that first chapter of Nahum, which is that the Lord is God, uh, we need to go back to Exodus chapter 20. And though it's going to take a few more minutes, I'm going to read the first five verses uh, because it will help when we come to look at Nahum a little bit closer. In Exodus 20, with the Ten Commandments, and at the beginning, God said this, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I am the Lord your God, and I'm a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and who keep my commandments. And you need to have those verses in the back of your mind when we look at Nathan, sorry, Nahum now. Because the, the prophecy opens with God is jealous. And as we just read, that comes from Exodus. And it's to do with the fact that God is saying he alone is God. And so the principle here is that God is jealous with the Assyrians. He's speaking about the burden of Nineveh. And he's telling the Assyrians that, that Nineveh, particularly being the capital city, that he's angry with them uh, because they're not worshipping him as God. In fact, uh, the parallel passage to Nahum, and that's partly why it's complicated, is to go to another book, which we don't have time to read, which is 2 Kings, chapters 18 and 19, if you want that for further reading. Uh, because this passage comes up where the Assyrians have come up to Jerusalem to conquer it. All the surrounding Towns of Judah have already been taken by the Assyrians. Israel, really, the rest of Israel has already been carried off as slaves to Assyria. And there's only little Jerusalem left, if you like. But Hezekiah prays to the Lord when this army comes and he pleads with God. Uh, he says, Do you not see what Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and his army, what they're saying about you, you know, and Sennacherib's been saying things like, 
don't trust in God to save you. He's never going to save you. In fact, he tells a lie and he says, God has actually sent the king of Assyria to go and conquer the place. You know, he's going to give it into Assyria's hand, which is not true. Uh, and he tries to discourage the people not to trust in God. But Hezekiah prays to God. And on the second announcement where he gets a letter, he places it before God and he appeals to God in prayer. And he asks God for help. He says, all those other gods, they did get conquered. All those other towns, they did get conquered because they were not God. They were not gods. They were idols. But you, Lord, are the living God. You know, show to the king of Assyria that you alone are God. And this is what God does. And to answer the king of Assyria does it in quite an incredible way by saying something about who God is. And in this passage, we get a number of dramatic examples of who God is in creation. That is the God of the whole earth. And you can imagine that when this prophecy was first announced, prophecies were normally oral. They were spoken. Uh, so they didn't read off a page saying, the Lord has his way in the whirlwind and the storm. It was far more dramatic than that. It was the Lord has his way in the whirlwind and the storm. It was very powerful the way this came across to the people, meaning that, you know, what does a whirlwind do? Uh, we, we have a man here who has some uh, American connections. When uh, we get storms like whirlwinds, tornadoes that rip through America, you know what it's like. Everything gets ripped up out the ground. And it's thrown around like matchsticks and it lands wherever. And God is saying how powerful he is, like the whirlwind and the storm. And that God actually is behind it, the whirlwind and the storm. And the clouds are the dust of his feet. Now, where are the clouds? Uh, they're, they're up there. And the picture there is how great and how high God is. You know, there's Sennacherib saying that God's not going to save them, that God's just like the idols, but he's not. He's in the whirlwind of the storm, the clouds are the dust of his feet. And if we were to strain to look up into the heavens, uh, using this picture analogy, the best we could hope to see is the very feet of God. We wouldn't see his face because he's so far high and above us. And nobody can touch him. You know, Sennacherib is not going to overthrow God. God is going to overthrow the Assyrians. And it says, he rebukes the sea and makes it dry and dries up all the rivers. Normally, when the kings came to attack cities, they dammed up the rivers so that the water didn't get into these fortified cities and they'd starve the people out. And God's saying, no, I'm not just going to dry up one river. I'm going to dry up the whole lot, the ocean as well. And if you've ever, if you live by the sea or you've ever stood by the ocean and looked out and seen the sea as far as the horizon, just imagine with one word, he rebukes with one word. It's all like a cracked pavement. It's all gone. Uh, and these are pictures, obviously, of destructive power, but they're targeted at the Ninevites. They're not targeted against God's people. And there are other pictures in there which we don't have time to go into but I think you get the picture of just how great God is and that's what he is conveying to his enemies who have deliberately defied him so then we ask well, well what about Judah what's happening to Judah in this book well the first thing to say is about the name of the book the name of the book is Nahum and Nahum means comfort primarily this book was written to comfort God's people. And the first bit of comfort seen in the fact the Lord is good is that he's not going to let his enemies get away with it. None of us would want the wicked to get away with the evil that they do. But God in his holiness is going to do something. He's not going to let the wicked get away with it. But also that goodness is displayed towards God's people. You know, in his goodness, he's going to come and rescue his people. Uh, he says he's a stronghold in the day of trouble. Uh, and it's a call to trust in God. 
and he knows those who trust him. That's a particular reference to Hezekiah's prayer. He was trusting in God to deliver. But the question is, what right have the people to be delivered? How has Judah ended up as little Jerusalem with all the surrounding towns captured and all of the rest of Israel carried away? Again, you have to go back to the Old Testament law to find the answer. And the answer is because they were idolaters as well. This book was written during the latter part of the life of Hezekiah, during the time of Manasseh, who followed, and Josiah. Now, two of those kings were good kings, but had a short reign. Uh, well, actually, Hezekiah's reign was quite long. But Manasseh's reign, he undid everything that Hezekiah did. So Hezekiah, who was the greatest uh, of Judah's kings, God says so, uh, in two kings, all that he did was undone by Manasseh, who followed. Manasseh reinstituted Baal worship. Uh, they were worshipping the hosts of heaven. Uh, and Manasseh even sacrificed two of his children in the fire to false gods. So he was a wicked king. And so Judah, in this situation, are idolaters. If you like, they're in exactly the same place that the Ninevites are in. But God, in his goodness, is going to treat them differently. Because God has chosen them. God has chosen them. And therefore, God is going to deliver them. And he says, I afflicted you. Uh, we're not to think for one moment that we're going to get away with our sins. Uh, whether we're Christians or unbelievers, God punishes sin. Uh, and some Christians can have a very hard experience in life uh, in being brought out of that sin. Uh, they suffer, but it's all for but the believer is to bring them back to God, is to bring about true repentance because the Lord is God. He's not to be viewed alongside other idols or compared to other idols. And he's to be worshipped alone as the God that he is, the one true God. So it says, as we draw to the end of the passage, not that God is going to come and save Judah in a whirlwind, or that he's going to come and uh, save them by sending somebody else. It says in verse 13, I will break off his yoke from you and burst your bonds apart. The picture is that God himself is going to come and he's going to save his people. He's going to break off the yoke of the Ninevites who want them as slaves. He's going to burst their bonds apart and he's going to set them free. And this is good news. Verse 15, behold, on the mountains, the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. This war is going to be over and there will be peace and God is going to bring it about. And at the end of the passage, it says the wicked one shall no more pass through you. This is talking about full and final victory. So the question is today, what are we as believers to learn from this passage? And there's two main lessons, really. The first is that prophecy has present and future significance. For the present, it's going to be deliverance for Judah. But it's also pointing to the New Testament era, to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he will do for his people. Uh, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. You'll find that verse in Romans chapter 10, verse 15. And it's applied to preaching. It's applied to the preaching of the gospel. The focus is not the preacher. The focus is the gospel itself. You know, and the message, of course, centers on the person of Jesus Christ, who came in the flesh to rescue his people. And that rescue plan, of course, centers on the cross. He came to deliver us from an enemy that's stronger than the Assyrians. He came to deliver us from Satan, who is our real enemy. And he came to break off his yoke and to 
burst apart the bonds of sin. The bonds of sin, which until Christ saved us, uh, kept us as slaves. But Christ broke off that yoke and the bonds of sin in his death at the cross when he died in our place for us. He came to rescue us and his rescue plan was a giving of himself. And really he's given himself to Judah in this passage. At the end of verse 15, you get the heart of God really towards his people where it says, oh Judah, this is the heart speaking. This is not the full force of the law. This is a heart of love. This is God's loving heart speaking to his people saying, oh Judah, keep your appointed feasts, perform your vows, which in New Testament terms is to say, come back to me and obey me. Remember, I'm the Lord your God and worship me alone. And so the passage warns us against pride. The Ninevites are a proud people, a powerful people. At this point in time, they're a very powerful nation, uh, very much a modern nation in a lot of ways, uh, and wealthy and successful. And they're about to face a really big defeat. But they're just like the Western nations. The Western nations are big and wealthy and powerful and successful. You may have read it, the, the newspaper in the past week where it says our faith is in the vaccines. Our faith, you know, as if you like, is in modern science and our own ability to save us. And it's a nonsense. Though we're grateful for the vaccines and we're grateful uh, for the help that we get from these things and from scientists who are very clever. All those things are really idols because it's God who our faith is to be in. God, the one who rescues his people and who provides for his people. And as I said, Judah, uh, at this point, were guilty of idolatry and they were being called back to the Lord to worship him alone. So the message for us today is to worship the living God and to remember who he is, the God of creation, the God who loves his people and will rescue them, but the God who will not at all acquit the wicked. So we're not to have any idols. Now, if you went to Google today and you looked up how many religions are out in the world, you'd find there are between 4,000 and 4,200 religions. This is what Google tells you, whether it's true or not, I don't know. Uh, but if you looked up, well, how many gods are there? Little g, how many gods are there? And they estimate there are about 330 million gods. And that's not counting all the people who don't believe anything who effectively are saying that they're God. They're, they're authors of their own destiny. And God is saying, I am the one true God, and you believe in me and in Jesus Christ, whom I have sent. So we're not to make gods of houses. We're not to make gods of families. We're not to make gods of celebrities. We're not to make gods of preachers, famous preachers. We're not to make gods of anything religious as such. We're not to make gods of our jobs or our intellect or our bank balance or our popularity or our hobbies or sports or alcohol or drugs or sex or anything. We are not to have any gods, but one God, the Lord. And we're to worship him because God will not tolerate idols. And so you say, where, how does this fit in with our prayer time today on revival? Well, certainly we need rescuing in this world from idols, both inside and outside the church. But also, uh, there are pictures in the Old Testament, and I encourage you to go and find them. I'm just gonna mention two, where revival comes when people give up their idols, when God brings them to see that he is the one true God, and they embrace him and him alone. And there's liberty in that, there's freedom in that. Uh, the two examples I have is that Gideon, in order to be God's instrument, the first job he had to do was to go and cut down his father's Asherah pole, and he actually was to chop it up into wood and make it into a sacrifice to the living God in order to show obedience to God 
And of course, God used him. He was a frightened man. He did it at night, but he still obeyed. And in Acts, we find that when the people came to the Lord Jesus Christ, they took their magic books and the things they'd formerly worshipped. They put them in a big heap and they set fire to them. Even though they were worth a lot of money, they were finished with that way of life. It was Christ and Christ alone. So the prayer today is for a needy world that needs to be rid of idols and that Christ would be preached and that God would make himself known and that the Lord would draw people to himself again, like he drew Judah back to himself and indeed us. I'm going to pray now and then it's over to you.